Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before the opening speech that we deliver, Mr. Leif Fransen, please allow me just a couple of minutes to give a few words of welcoming and acknowledgement. You are at the Real Maestranza de Caballería de Ronda, a chivalry institution founded by Philip II in 1573. Because today we are to speak about the future and not about the past, we will, I will spare you about our, our history. Uh, let me just tell you that as a royal institution, uh, the Maestranza has been chaired by the kings of Spain since the second half of the 18th century. And uh, I have, in my case, the honor of representing His Majesty in this uh, historical vestige. The honor, but not the merit. Uh, this honor that permits me, for instance, to address you here today, is given to me not because I have any special qualification or knowledge, but just because my father and my grandfathers and great-grandfathers have been here since the foundation. So, it is with personal modesty and institutional pride that I welcome you to this non-profit institution rooted in the past and looking at the future. Only the institutions that look at the future are able to preserve the past. Only the societies, the countries that advance, that compete, that are really competitive, are those that preserve better their heritage, their institutions, the libraries, or their traditions. Because of our search for excellency and interest in education, we grant scholarships and awards to the best students of the regions. Lots of them are here today with us. We founded and managed Spain in Spain history, the European network of historical research competitions for young students. Hundreds of Spanish students have competed in this institution. We are founding members of Future Lab Europe, and now we have the honor and the pleasure of celebrating the first Ronda Forum. We have lots of people to thank. Future Lab Europe, European Policy Center, Aspen Institute Spain, and of course the relevant panelists who are with us today. Uh, last but not least, we have the honor to have with us Mrs. Liv Fransen, Director for Social Policies and Europe uh, 2020 of the European Commission. Dr. Fransen, please. Good morning, everybody. Technology works perfect. Thanks. <laughs> One thing that I'm sorry about is that the books that I sent didn't arrive, but I hope they, they might turn up one day and, and be distributed. I'm very honored to be here, and thanks for the nice introduction and for uh, inviting me to this place. Also, thanks to Hans and uh, Ignacio and everybody who has made this possible. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I, I find the link between the past and the future very important. So you introduced this already, and this is really what it is about. The children uh, that are now in school or out of school, uh, as I saw in Ronda yesterday, um, they will be um, taking their pensions in 2080. And we, none of us, really know how the world will look like in 2080. So the best thing we can do, I think, me as a policymaker, you as a entrepreneurs, as a young people, as, is make sure that the future is bright by providing education, creativity, flexibility, and adapting the policies where they need to be. That's why I'm very honored to be here, not just to speak, but also to listen. Because as a policymaker, I think it is important to hear what is alive, what is not going right, what could be done better by your own authorities, policymakers, entrepreneurs, but also by the European Commission, because we are all in one, 
interdependent world more and more and surely in Europe we are very interdependent even if we don't want it to be sometimes. I have, I have asked the organizers to provide you with a few of my slides because I had, I had prepared a presentation with uh, um, ten, 10 slides but they told me that was too much so you only have a few of the most difficult ones because, but I would like to, to talk to you about some of the facts then I would like to tell you a little bit more of the policies that the Commission is putting in place and then I would like to provide you um, with the information where you can find more information and the book was one of these issues but I've also left a, a stick with the information with all of the slides in there for those that would want to have them First of all, you have the first slide you have is um, in your, is, it looks something like this, quite scary in a way, because it is about youth unemployment. I just wanted to start with youth unemployment because it is one of our concerns in, in Europe, but actually also in some other areas of the world. But in Europe it's quite uh, serious. And when you look at the map, you will see specifically that the youth unemployment, specifically in some areas, uh, southern areas more, are very drastic. I mean, you, you will see in the, in the slide, if you can read it, something like around 50% of unemployment about, people, about young people between 15 and 24 years old. Now, what we more and more look at is not only youth unemployment, but where where are the young people, um, are they in school, or are they studying, are they being trained, or are they working? So we call that needs. Non, not in education, uh, training, or um, work, employment. For the moment we have seven, uh, seven and a half million young people between 15 and 24 that we call needs. So I will tell you what we are trying to do, but also what uh, some of the countries should try to do. What is very clear is that there is a major mismatch between the skills and the competences of young people and the, the, what the market expects, and especially also in countries like Spain that is the case. The second slide that you don't have is basically uh, giving the what we call the PISA score. It measures the outcomes in school, uh, outcomes related to mathematics, to literacy, to a range of, of areas. And there we rank, the, the OECD ranks the countries, and number one this year is Shanghai. Quite amazing, no? Number two is Korea, Number three is Japan. The first country of Europe that is in that ranking is the Netherlands. The last is Bulgaria, Romania, Hungar Hungary, and actually also Sweden is quite la low in the mathematics score, a little bit better in the, in the literacy score, but still, this means something. This is measuring, it doesn't mean everything, but it's measuring really how good your schools are adapting uh, and how, uh, how well people are trained, actually, when they measure 15 years old. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, influences. One of the biggest influence, for example, is if children are going to uh, early childhood education and care early before three years old has the best outcome and a lot of the countries the previous uh, Eastern European countries very often don't want to send their children anymore to early child care um, because they were forced under the communist countries uh, uh, regime to put their kids in, in, in crashes and they don't want to do this anymore. But it has an impact on the outcome at 15 years old and especially for the poorest. The poorest or the, the, the single household uh, where, where mothers or fathers don't have enough time to deal with their children or to educate them or help them at school, uh, it, with the school early on. So all of this has a major influence and it's something that children or young people carry with them forever. And with the low fertility in Europe and with the aging society, we really need all of the children 
to be educated and to skilled and develop their competences. Another slide you don't have, but is how well people are staying in school until 18. Early school leaving rate, we call that. The early school leaving rate, the number one is Spain. You have 25% of people leaving school early in Spain. The lowest is Croatia. So, I mean, there's also, and, and it's, it's, the, the ranking is like three, that's why I like to see the graphs, because the difference is not just minor, it's a major difference. Of course, there's been a reason for that in Spain. There was a boom in construction, and a lot of young people thought they could do more and better uh, in construction than, uh, than going to boring schools, maybe which I, I, I sympathize with sometimes. It also depends on how, you, how, how innovative and creative schools are also, of course. But with the, the, the collapse of the, the construction, and very often, in the meantime, these uh, young people, young men, very often have been married to uh, young women that are also not skilled, also not working, and this creates poverty, it creates disruption in marriages, it creates poverty among children even, because these couples have children in the meantime. So this is really a problem that needs to be cracked uh, in Spain, especially quite urgently, but a, a, a range of other countries. The number two is Malta, the number three is Portugal, the number three, four is Italy, then it's Romania, so it's clear, and then it's UK. So it's clear that early school leaving is an issue. We have under the 2020 strategy of Europe, we have agreed that we should come under the 10 percent by 2020. Now Spain has not even put that as, as a target. Uh, the other countries have put that as a target, but Spain and Italy have not even put 20, 10 percent of early school leavers as a target. So, so they don't see that they can reach this. This is, of course, very important and needs to be tackled quite uh, urgently, I believe. Then the second slide you do have, actually, is I want to go from education to entrepreneurship. Some of you might, have, uh, might know more about this because a lot of you have, uh, are in entrepreneurs uh, or have read actually The Economist last week because I think it was, uh, it, the, the article was actually uh, mentioned in the, in the Economist last week. But entrepreneurship, the first question uh, to ask is how do you measure entrepreneurship? What is real good entrepreneurship? It can be um, in a lot of articles or a lot of policy makers measure entrepreneurship and, and in the Commission some of that is also the case. Entrepreneurship by the number of small and medium enterprises. But others really focus on the innovative aspect. Okay, so innovation is not equal to small and medium enterprises. The majority of small and medium ent enterprises are very often uh, small, very often even one person company that is doing routine jobs or, or doing not an innovation job. So what uh, recently the, the you have the slide, so the, the people that have been working on this is Magnus Hendricks and, and, and Tino Sanai Daya. There's a very interesting article. They have looked at the, the measuring entrepreneurship in another way. There, we can have a lot of discussions about is this the right measurement, but it, is, it looks uh, really as at the innovation perspective from the perspective of did they succeed really in accumulation of wealth, the founders of the new business ventures. So it's a very American way of looking, in a way. There, of course, Hong Kong is coming first, Israel n number two, is US uh, third, and Spain is actually not doing bad, it's doing a little bit better than a medium, uh, the EU15 is measured there. So a lot of discussions, is this the right way of looking at entrepreneurship from the innovative perspective. But of course, it's the innovation that will increase growth and that will increase competitiveness of uh, a country. 
not necessarily the routine SMEs. So, so this is, if you look at growth, and the Europe 2020 strategy is actually about growth and competitiveness of Europe in, the, in a globalized society, then this is something to look at. But what the article sees also, and what we see more and more, is that innovative, successful, big entrepreneur, entrepreneurs that become really uh, wealth uh, creation and, and growth creation very often also decrease actually the small and medium enterprises. Of course, the big, uh, the, the article uh, gives the example of the big Walmart has uh, killed all of the little shops in a way. Amazon.com has killed all of the little bookshops. So there's policy, for, for policy this is not that simple in a way to see where we should uh, focus on and maybe it's a good point for discussion. What we also see is that the successful innovative entrepreneurs most of the time are very highly skilled. So the, que the, 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 the story of uh, um, non-skilled or lower skilled people being successful, like some, uh, some exceptions have happened, is, is really not the, the majority of or the reality. So high skills and education is also important in that case. Then a third slide you have is um, a, st a study that I found quite interesting that we did across Europe and I have results on a few countries, but it looks like it's a, there's a green, but you don't even have the, the color, so it's a bit difficult. But anyway, the originals are all available here. The, I, I only selected for you the Spanish example, but it, sh it measures actually the social enterprises across Europe. Social enterprises now. Okay, so it's not the big business innovative uh, that we have uh, looked at, but here we've looked at social enterprises. Now, across Europe, social enterprises, even the terminology and what you classify as a social enterprise is not that simple. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area, and I think it's one of the really fascinating areas where, you, where, where I see a lot of young people want to invest in, want to, want to do well and do good, as they say, uh, and I think it's, it's really a major uh, potential for growth, in my opinion, also social enterprise um, in, in a range of countries. In Spain, you see that most of the social enterprises, or nearly half, are focusing on employment and training. A little bit, uh, the second area that they focus on is on the green economy. And then a little bit on community development, very little on social services, where you can also have a lot of innovation, actually. Where the, what, you, what you have in other countries is very different. And across Europe, the, the, the situation is very different. So if any of you are interested, we have these slides on, on several countries. But the second country that I have, for example, is totally different, Hungary. There, the majority goes to social services and the second goes to education. And in the UK, the situation is again totally different. There, the majority of social enterprise goes to community development. But all of this it needs much more analysis to see does policy or, or needs or the market influence these choices or can we, can, can we do something to, to help actually even more social enterprises to, to harness the innovation that we need in the social welfare state because we do need innovation, a lot of innovation in social welfare state in Europe for the future to, um, to really keep the standards that our populations want but modernize with an aging uh, society and with less people working for the same social protection that we expect. Then, what we also looked at and what I find quite interesting is that social enterprises actually are very strong innovators. And they are innovators in general, so you have the next slide that gives you the two areas there. Social enterprises on the left, they are measured as radical innovators, and they are, and 
what you don't see here is that even social enterprises managed and started up with by women are even more innovative. So women seem to be quite risk takers in social enterprises and innovation. So very, very interesting. The right side is measuring the social enterprises are radical service innovators which is also uh, very, very drastic in some countries even more than in others. In Hungary, for example, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very clear. Um, in the UK and Sweden, it's a bit less. In Spain, it's, it's, mu it's much less, but there's still a difference. So social entrepreneurs are innovators. We need innovators in social welfare reforms. And uh, so we're going to focus more and more also on harnessing that innovation and creativity among social entrepreneurs to help with the reforms. Now, what is uh, Europe uh, doing other than uh, gathering figures? Actually, we have a lot of facts and figures that should be used much more because I think it's useful to see and that's, uh, to see where countries are and then to analyze where, why. Uh, why and what can be done about it. Now, the European, uh, the European response uh, in 2010 has been the European uh, strategy for 2020 that is focusing on growth and, um, and competitiveness. You will remember that a year or two before, in 2008, we had a crisis. To 2010, we developed this strategy, quite integrated strategy of smart, sustainable, inclusive um, uh, strategy. I think the strategy didn't really fully take into account the depth and the length of the crisis. At that stage, we were, most of us were really not prepared to see the, the extent of the financial crisis, uh, here the crisis in the banks and the, and the construction, uh, but then also the, the, the crisis with the, the euro. The, the, the euro countries have actually suffered mo more, and, uh, and, and Europe actually going more into divergence instead of convergence. For the first time, when Europe was actually created to converge, we, had, we see now divergence. And we have very, very clear uh, data on this also. This cannot be the right way for Europe because, I mean, if, if we have divergence, we have less and less credibility uh, among populations to make real reforms and to do the right things and to work together. And so you see that reaction already in some countries that were always very pro-European. Denmark has always been difficult, but... <laughs> But some of the other countries, even in my own country in Belgium, you start now seeing, seeing reactions against uh, the European context because people feel that, that, that it's not the right thing and not the right club to be. And in Spain, it's always been the most, uh, uh, folk, I mean, most positive about Europe in a way. I was, uh, I was always very happy to come and speak about Europe, whereas in the UK sometimes I'm, I have to hide that I'm, I'm working for the, <laughs> for the European uh, Commission. So, so the strategy was there. The instruments have mainly been developed to stabilize the euro. A crisis, short time, short sh response. And we in the social employment areas had difficulties to really uh, come up with interesting proposals, suggestions, uh, um, appeals uh, that a, a social crisis was on the, on the brink of, uh, of really uh, disrupting uh, Europe and we will see the results of that a little bit in the elections I believe next year. But, uh, okay, but in the meantime we have uh, come up with a social impact investment with social investment proposals, that's the books that I, uh, that I, that I, want, that I wanted you to have, uh, with an employment package, with a youth employment package, with a youth guarantee, with a range of initiatives, really, um, to, and I will very briefly go over some of the initiatives and then in private conversations or in the panel maybe we can uh, deepen if you are interested in some of this. What we see the first one is a social investment package. The social investment package was really to show, like, we can do better with the same money. The countries that do best in social protection and securing their populations are, of course, the countries that 
have reformed when there was growth. The, 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 the best example of that is really Denmark. Denmark has reformed their social system, in a way, their social policies, in an investment approach. Do early, prevent the risks, have women participate in the labor market, have uh, children early, childhood education and care. I mean, the, the, this whole approach is a social investment approach. Work longer, uh, but be flexible during the flex security was also invented there, but uh, with a lot of reactions from other countries. But what we see, though, therefore, is when you invest enough and do the right things, you can secure uh, better during a difficult time like a crisis situation. Now, we see also uh, a slide that you don't have, but we, we measured really how, how much countries have invested in the social, social policies and what the outcome is with poverty. Denmark is doing the best with the investment they have. But we see also where, where some countries, and here Spain is, Spain or Hungary or Italy or Greece are not doing very well, and then you have uh, Bulgaria, Romania uh, always at the lowest end. But what you see is that some countries with the same money do better. So there is a possibility already to do better with with the same money you have, because for the moment there is not a lot of f fiscal space for the public sector to to really um, to to grow uh, fast during the or or to, or to even cut in some uh, some cases. So then we looked at uh, so we say more efficient use of the public funds is 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 a prerequisite that is what we focus on in greece in portugal with trying to help uh, really make the most efficient use of uh, towards a, a social investment approach then we looked at uh, the this is a fifth slide you have because it's a complicated one but i just want you to and you as you don't have the colors it's not going to help very much also but that slide gives a more multidimensional way of measuring do the what do the countries do right and here in this slide you have actually hungary latvia and estonia but what it says, and the dotted line is the mean, is the average for Europe in total. So you see that here most of the countries are um, investing in cash expenditure much more than the average. Hungary is investing a lot, uh, is, is, is doing a lot of cash transfers. You have much lower than other countries in Europe expenditure in kind, that means services, social services. What you see in a social investment approach and the successful countries is that you invest much more in services because you can accompany services especially that accompany people, uh, look at what they need at that moment, education, skills, homes, uh, I mean, there, there is a range of areas where you can intervene rather than doing cash transfers. And when you look at the outcomes for Hungary, for example, the cash transfers briefly diminish the poverty in general, but because the services are not there and women don't go to work because there is no childcare services or they don't want to use the childcare services, there is much more poverty among the children, which cannot be the right thing. So we are now, for the first time, developing ways that we can measure the, the, the complexity of all of the social policies. And that's what this slide shows as one of the examples, in a way. And you see, again, how different countries really can learn from each other uh, very much. Then, the, so we have a social investment package where we focus very much on that. Then we have a youth employment package where we focus on four areas. And the first area is, I'm, I'm not going to have time to go really in depth, but I just want to mention them. The first one is a quality framework for traineeship. The idea is really here, and this is launched already last year, it's to have a better uptake of quality traineeship. We find that much better can be done in a lot of countries with the traineeships that are available or make more of them available and much more links between business and schools or business and universities. 
I asked a few around my table last night and I found that there was an, improve possible, an improvement possible here in Spain but probably in most of the countries uh, that is the case. So we are really measuring now the quality, uh, quality framework in the countries of their traineeships and trying to advise and recommend uh, ways of doing better. The other uh, issue that we put, uh, the, the other initiative that we put up is a European Alliance for Apprenticeships. There we put also public authorities, business and social partners together with really to develop appropriate apprenticeships and we finance some of this and we uh, work with the public authorities in the countries to finance this. The third area and that we have uh, worked on quite, quite a lot is uh, the new URES. It's a, it's a website actually that um, where we, it's, it's a kind of European job placement because we believe that in the short run, in the long run, of course, mobility is not the solution, but for the moment, more mobility would provide more, uh, more, more possibilities for a lot of young people to, uh, to, to not lose their skills and competences, develop them more, and, then in, in, and take up jobs in other places where they are at this stage. So that's supported by the Commission for 12 million euros. It's in a test phase for the moment, but uh, I hope it will, it will pro it provides skills, it provides job placements uh, uh, in, in a range of countries, and uh, it provides also help to move to places and uh, if uh, a job is available. And then the fourth big initiative is the youth guarantee. The youth guarantee is something that all of the ministers in all of Europe have agreed to put in place last year. We have, the Commission has put 6 billion euros on the youth guarantee for all of the countries, especially the countries that have the biggest problem. And the countries that have the biggest problem are, of course, Greece and Spain for the moment. Um, I, am, I, I, I must say that uh, a few months ago, all of the countries should have come up with plans so that the money could go and finance these plans. Spain is a bit late with introducing these plans, in a way, and therefore the money cannot really be used yet. So I would plead with any of you, if you are in a, in a, in a role of uh, where you can ha have an influence, is really to develop these plans as much as possible. Uh, and the, these are not only public, also private public, uh, private public partnerships, businesses. It depends on the countries how they want to do it. But the outcome should be that none of the young people between 15 and 24 are all of them should be in jobs, or in training, or in education. So no needs. Okay. So that's the outcome that is expected from all of the countries. And that's the guarantee that has been put in place. And that should be four months. Within the four months of leaving a job, or an education, or... So this is the guarantee that all of your ministers in Europe have agreed to put in place. It's been put in place, the model is not invented in Brussels, the model was used because it is, uh, it is tested already and it's working well in Finland and in a few other countries in Finland and Austria I believe, so, so there's uh, the examples, it's not just something that, that somebody uh, just invented in an, in an office in Brussels. And because of the dramatic loss of human capital by young people not, ha not being in training or in education or in employment, uh, this was taken up as a major initiative and, and it is still the major initiative, I believe, until the end of this college and I hope it will continue, of course, also. So that's for social investment, employment, youth employment, very briefly a few initiatives. Then we also have an initiative on social entrepreneurship. We, had, uh, we provided uh, microcredits uh, in the previous, um, previous uh, period of the budget for 50 million euro to set up social entrepreneurs. 
um, and to help mentor, coach social entrepreneurs. This was a testing period. We see that uh, at least 30% of these loans have been taken up successfully by young people. So there is, there is an interest in the market and in, we, we, we think a lot of improvements can still be done uh, in, uh, in mentoring, coaching and maybe I will learn from you also what else can be put in place. Now under the new period of, uh, of the budget that starts this year, we have set aside 170 million euro for social entrepreneurs set up, microcredits and a range of uh, mentorships and, and, and incubators. So there is a potential there. Of, of course, this is not going to be enough. This is additional to what the countries should do and can do. But that's, um, so I wanted you to basically know a few of the areas where there is potential in Europe. There is a range of other areas, of course. There is a lot of SME support. There is a lot of, I'm, I'm not going into this. There is, of course, the classical Erasmus that has been financed uh, even more. Uh, there is also Erasmus exchange for in work situations, not just students. So there is a lot of potential there. And my two last uh, slides, actually, that I would uh, invite the organizers to share uh, with people is basically where you can find more information on all of these initiatives on the website, because uh, sometimes we are not that transparent in making the uh, information available. And so instead of you having to look for everything, it is summarized in, in a, range of, uh, uh, a range of slides. I think I want to keep it here and I hope I, I, hope I have given you a lot of uh, uh, information for further debate and discussion and I, ho I hope to learn a lot from you too. Thank you very much, Dr. Franzen. Thank you much, everybody. I'm now going to swap in Spanish. So we are going to give a relief to our simultaneous translators. So, muchas gracias. Eh, vamos un poco, bueno, el tiempo se nos ha echado encima, lo cual eh, era de esperar y estamos contentos, pero vamos a ver si conseguimos hacer un poco de, eh, si podemos recuperar. En cualquier caso, en, en el tiempo libre para la, para la comida, recuperaremos este, este tiempo. Eh, eh, quiero recordar que pueden formular preguntas y comentarios a través de Twitter. Eh, Benjamin Enin y Tina Gotard están eh, trabajando en ello, aquí en la mesa técnica, y podrán utilizar el hashtag eh, RondaForum. Nuestros moderadores se encargarán de transmitir algunas de estas preguntas y comentarios a los ponentes. Me gustaría ahora invitar a los tres jóvenes profesionales, miembros de Future Lab Europe, eh, programa de jóvenes líderes europeos que debatirán con la doctora Fransen. Eh, entre ellos están Milan Balaban, de Bosnia-Herzegovina, eh, Marcida Vandili, de Albania, Estefanía Almenta, de Ronda, España. Y este debate va a estar moderado por eh, Linde Suidema, la nueva directora del proyecto Future Lab Europe para esta nueva generación. Linde, te dé paso la palabra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't speak Spanish, but um, uh, I understood most of, uh, of what you said. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Um, first of all, uh, thank you to Real Maestranza to opening your doors for, for this debate um, and, and to all the young people uh, in, the, in uh, taking the stage with Liebe France today. I think uh, it's a beautiful place uh, indeed. So thank you for that. Um, just before we, um, we start the debate between uh, these future lovers and indeed uh, an alumni from Real Maestranza as well, um, uh, just a formal note. Um, uh, Milan could not make it uh, today and uh, um, Daniel Jokieski.
it was um, uh, was so good to, to take his place this uh, this morning. So um, this is um, this is a Europe at debate that is one of the the uh, key elements of, of Future Lab, of which I am uh, I am the program leader, um, uh, which uh, gives throughout Europe young people the the chance to to take the stage with decision makers and and politicians to to speak their minds and. Um, and speak there and show their position on, on European issues. So the form, the form of, of this debate um, will be that uh, each of our, our future labors will raise a question uh, to, to Lieve Franse. And um, I'm happy to start with uh, Estefania, who is right on my right here. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Franson, for, for your inspiring speech. Um, when you were, uh, well, first of all, I'm Stefania and I'm from Ronda, and currently I'm a trainer and consultant based in Madrid. So, Dr. Franson, when you were describing the social investment package, you said, we can do better with the same money. And I couldn't agree more. What I wonder and worries me is if we can still do better with much less money. So my question to you is, how are austerity measures compatible with improving youth perspective, perspectives and achieving Europe 2020 goals? Yes, I, um, I wanted to ask, to ask uh, you to reply uh, after each question, and then after after the three questions, we will also open um, to the floor for for questions. So please hold your hold your questions till the last uh, about 20 minutes of the debate, please. So, Liebe Franse, can I keep this on all the time, or I have to? Yeah, okay. Sorry, because it's a bit of a gymnastic here with the. <laughs> I only have two ears, <laughs> and I need three, actually. <laughs> so that's a question of austerity with my ears. But the, you, your question is, of course, uh, the question that is being raised by everybody all the time. And it's, um, it, it's a bit of a painful question, in a way, because I, uh, what we, we can say, yes, all of, the con all of the countries, and especially the countries that do worst for the moment, can do better with the money they have. This is not the time in some of the countries to increase the, uh, the budget. I also don't think it's the time to decrease the budget. Okay? I think some countries, and sometimes under, under, uh, under advice from others, especially uh, the Commission and sometimes IMF, depending in which countries, have not necessarily always done, done the cuts in the most uh, intelligent way. So, I, uh, my, my conclusion basically is that we need to do, we need to do things much more in an integrated way that people that know the, the ministries or the people that know where uh, efficiency gains can be made uh, in, in, in areas um, are at the table when these decisions are taken. And quite often these days the decisions have been taken too drastically sometimes by ministers of finance alone without having a dialogue really on looking on with the, the, the ministries uh, that deal with social investment in meaning education, health, uh, uh, social protection. So I, I would plea for a much more integrated dialogue in the countries and also in Europe. The instruments that we have developed in European context have really been urgency instruments do, to really focus on the stability of the euro and the saving of the banks. That was and remains important, of course, because if that is not, if that is not saved, it, the impact would have even be worse. But that was, that was and is a, a short-term short -term, uh, strategy 
that needs now to be, uh, I mean, the, the, the real social in investment side need to be uh, taken up much better uh, in, in a range of countries. Uh, we have an opportunity now, the society in Europe has an opportunity now also to make their voices heard also during the, there will be, there, there is now an, an assessment, an evaluation of the 2020 strategy and what went wrong and what went better and what, what needs to be improved. And there, there will be a wide consultation starting the end of March until next year, March, when the decisions will have to be taken on where improvements have to be made or where changes have to be made. So uh, we should be all humble. We didn't uh, always do the right things in the right way. Uh, and we, that is a collective responsibility, of course. The 2020 strategy has been a strategy not only from the Commission, but agreed and, and taken up by all of the, all of the uh, governments. Thank okay. you. I just want to give you the chance to, to respond to that quickly. Uh, Stefania, if you, uh, if you want. Yeah, okay, quickly, just to say that um, Actually, austerity measure, measures have severely damaged social cohesion. So even when I understand that it was urgent and important to stabilize the euro and the eurozone and, and, uh, and deal with these ec very economic matters, people who were suffering the most from this were, were actually people who, who were already at risk. And some more people are getting in, are already in risk or in the at-risk uh, area. So I don't know if we can consider that the urgent thing was done and then we can actually matter with more important things. Thank you. Daniel, can I refer to you? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Daniel Gokeski, I'm coming from Macedonia and I'm currently studying public policy at University College London. Is this okay? Okay, University College London, and I work as a creative director in London for a company that deals with social entrepreneurship and social economy. So that's where I'll have my focus on the questions. I just wanted to firstly highlight several of your points and support them with several arguments done by Commission as well, that actually the social economy brings the democratic cooperation, the reciprocity and the equality as key principles that were damaged a lot after the crisis and the development afterwards. So the values as that were one of the oldest of Europe, a solidarity, innovation, voluntary involvement in something that the social economy can bring again on the stage and make greater income and opportunities for all. That is much different than the mainstream business as usual approach that leaves very vulnerable groups on the side during this crisis. And there are just three main points of the last uh, job creation in social entrepreneurship report by OECD and the Commission where it stated that there is an increase in employment level. Also, there is a positive trend of employment with, of the voluntary groups that are raising in this period. And what is more even important, there's the high quality jobs as a find as a very important social goal because although we're in a very bad situation with union unemployment, it doesn't mean that we should go for any job that is provided by us, but we need high quality job that, mean, that meets our high quality skills. So today here I want to spoke in, in the name of the millennials, my generation, that actually has all the skills and values that can meet social entrepreneurship and social development and entrepreneurship in general, and among others, those are the need for social impact, the cooperation, the individual progress, the reverse mental mentorship, the lack of trust, unfortunately, in the mainstream economy and the uh, governmental institutions, and something that you've uh, mentioned is the risky mentality. But the crisis is bringing a lot of pressure on all, all those skills and making us be afraid of making the most of it and just melt in the cooperation, international cooperation business structure. And during my studies now, I have put all of my focus on the European policies for youth unemployment, and I've noticed that there is a big lack of activities and policies for bridging social entrepreneurship, social economy, and youth unemployment. Separately, as yes, we have elaborated a lot on the policies, and they will show results in future because most of them have just started. But I would like to hear your opinion of, are there opportunities to be more cost effective in the policies by bridging these activities, by connecting youth, young people, and social entrepreneurship opportunities, 
and if that's how that can be done, because in my company and several partners we're working a lot, my focus is mostly on Mediterranean, so I can even say that even the non-EU countries have found a social transformation from bottom-up approach, thanks to the social enterprises, much effective and much desirable by the, by the social community. And that brings also to what Stefania mentioned about the social cohesion, bringing the social cohesion again on the agenda. So several thoughts on that. Thank you. This is a, a very big uh, area of, uh, of discussion that you're touching on. And uh, thank you for this. This is a, I, I hope that we can take up some of, uh, um, uh, some of it further and maybe come with some of the suggestions or That's initiatives right. that you would think to, we could take or, or somebody else could take. Uh, I, I can see that there is, we, we have the youth, and employ, uh, youth initiatives, youth employment initiatives, and we have the social entrepreneur initiatives. There, there, there might be more links to be made, but the links to be made should be done at country level, actually. Because the youth guarantee, for example, is something that we agree at what the outcome should be, but we don't dictate to the countries what should be done because the countries are so different. And so social entrepreneurship could be one of the areas that are taken up under the youth guarantee with some in, in the, some of the countries. Um, we will also launch a call for innovative approaches and social entrepreneurship on social services uh, in the next uh, two months probably. So there is a range of areas that, that we see that more can be done. And I agree with you, your situation, uh, you, you, your statement that more can be done to link both. I also believe personally very much that social entrepreneurship among young people and the millenniums is really something that is taken up in, in your generation and is a very positive side, so we need to uh, support this as much as possible. Where I'm always afraid is, um, is, is that public sector intervenes too much mm -hmm. because social entrepreneurship should be social entrepreneurship and it should not necessarily be dictated from the public sector. And, 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 and so, so we need to have that right balance, where are the incentives, what needs to be done. From the analysis I see for the moment and the discussions I've had, I think more can be done to accompany young entrepreneurs in mentoring, coaching, helping them with business uh, experiences. And, and in a range of countries that is happening, with some kind of mentoring hubs and so. But maybe there is an area where, where initi further initiatives can be taken. But I'm open for suggestions. Yes, well, I would just like to respond to that, that there are very good positive examples of chairmanship. We're, mm -hmm. we're already cooperating with the United Nations Alliance of mm -hmm. Civilization on several generations for social entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. also with the British Council. Hopefully mm -hmm. that will sure. be done with the union. And yes, you're very right that it should come on national level because social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. mainly should be based on local level yeah. with the local communities. Yeah. Yeah. But on supranational level, there just can be more support in the way that it can be considered less risky by the business sector, the bank system for supporting yeah. them. Yeah. Also, the corporate social responsibility can put, the business sector can put more effort and more money in the social enterprises that is already happening instead of doing their mm -hmm. own uh, CSR. Yeah. So there are opportunities yeah. on national and international level and I would like to elaborate maybe later on that even more. Fully Thank agree. you. Thank you. Well, I guess it's I guess. my turn now. Uh, yes, hello, Mercida. everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mercida. Just a very short introduction. I'm from Albania, but I'm currently studying in Belgium in the University of Antwerp. I'm a PhD student there. And actually, this is one of the few uh, commonalities I'm sharing with Mrs. Franson, because I, I was reading through uh, her personal achievements, and I, I saw that you also were a student in, um, in the University of Antwerp. Um, actually, what I would like to, I would like first of all to say that I'm very honored to be here with Mrs. Franson in the same panel and I would also like to thank you for the very inspiring speech for, for all of us. I would like to 
to discuss about one of the recent studies that the participants of Future Lab Europe have conducted. And uh, there's a study we, we um, asked the young people about the most current, uh, current uh, concerns that they have in Europe and also connecting it to the European elections that are coming in May. What we have seen is that uh, from all the countries that were included, we, we spread the survey and all the young people from all Europe, including Western Balkans, they answered the questions and they brought into the topic again the youth unemployment and ed education. Personally, I do see that there is a mismatch in uh, the qualification of young people and what the market is offering right now. We see that young people, they are usually overly qualified, so they have all the right qualifications um, in terms of education and vocational and professional training. And from the other side, we see that the market is not offering them jobs. Even though the EU is trying to uh, feed this mid-match uh, through offering different initiatives and different programs, still there is a lot of things and much to be done. So um, what I would like to, uh, to ask you is that how can the EU do better in order to, um, in order to have a perfect match between the market and uh, uh, the qualifications of young people? And also, is it that reachable that the uh, uh, targets of the Europe 2020, they will be reached within the 2020 um, in terms of offering a more smart, sustainable and inclusive growth? Thank you. Mrs. Swanson. Thank you. I see. Thanks for your comments. I see basically two two main areas of your your questions. Is uh, can we do better, or can 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 we collectively, Commission and countries, uh, do better in uh, more initiatives about you? Um, Maybe more initiatives comes back to, to the previous speakers also with the business. Maybe there is an initiative that we need to take more with business. I, I don't fully agree with, with your matching of skills because what you see when, you, when we look, and maybe we should compare our studies, but uh, when we look we see that there is like 2 million jobs open that cannot be filled by, because of the skills mismatch for the moment. So there is something there that the supply and demand needs to be matching uh, better. Um, there, there, there are a, a range of opportunities. We, for the moment, work on green jobs, white jobs. Uh, we work with, with industry there, but maybe more initiatives need to, to be taken in that area. I'm thinking of initiatives also, like your previous speaker spoke about, uh, making CSR evolve and also social services evolve into a more social entrepreneur um, uptake. So there's a range of, uh, I'm, I'm open for, for suggestions and, and thinking of, of any initiatives that we could take to make that better, but I think the skills mismatch is still in uh, an area and that will continue to increase in the future unless uh, the education and school schooling is also improved in a range of countries and some countries more than I mean in Antwerp or in, in Belgium that's not necessarily the case but even in Belgium you see the difference between uh, the, the different uh, groups uh, in, in society or the north and the south uh, uh, so, so even in regions uh, in some of the countries uh, Romania, Bulgaria, we really see regions of extreme poverty and aging at the same time and total disinvestment. Uh, this cannot be and there is a major mismatch there. The second question that I see in you uh, or that I, I, uh, I perceive as, uh, as also very important is the uh, will we reach the targets? Um, for the moment, the only target that we seem to reach uh, with the analysis that we made is uh, climate and energy and for the wrong reasons. Because we have, we are reaching the target because the business, uh, we, we have produced less. And therefore we have produced also less uh, um, CO2 and, 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 and so, but this is not the right reason of reaching a target. Whereas the target that I'm in charge of, the poverty target, we have, uh, we had uh, the task actually collectively to decrease with 20 million uh, people living in poverty and we have, uh, since we started measuring in 2008, uh, we have 6 million, 0.6 6 
more people in living in, in, in poverty and actually more people living in material deprivation poverty, which is the worst, mainly in the countries like Romania, Latvia, uh, uh, Bulgaria. Um, but still, this is, of course, problematic. That's why we need to do more, better and faster, I believe. Uh, I don't think... The, the, this discussion will take uh, will take up, will will be taken up by society in general i hope in the in the future months uh, and see what needs to be done better faster and and more by by whom also because it is not something the strategy is not something that is implemented from brussels but uh, um, I, th I think uh, we need to do much uh, clearer. We, the strategy was saying uh, we need to, to make sure that uh, p uh, children stay in school, uh, that uh, develop the right skills, that um, people are lifting out of poverty. But what it didn't say was really uh, how to do this. And uh, the, the packages that have come after what I discussed, the uh, social investment package, the employment package, the youth package, was very much more geared to how this should be done. And I think we are now at that stage. I find one of the fascinating uh, moments that I, I see beyond uh, an, uh, debates like this is, is also the member states for the first time seem to come together and discuss in, in quite an open form how to reform, how to make the reforms. And, and so there is an opening now for the first time in a way to learn faster from each other. Thank you. Marcida, would you like to respond to Short that? Short comment. Uh, well, actually, I absolutely agree with the fact that the Europe 2020 targets are very ambitious and very um, um, ambitious to be achieved. But um, I also agree in the fact that there should be a more binding character um, in the level um, of national states in terms that all the packages that you mentioned for employment or for social investment and then the youth guarantee should be um, implemented in the right way and they, sh they should offer the right um, uh, they should offer the, uh, the right qualifications and the, uh, they should be implemented in the right direction for the young people so the binding character for me it's uh, very important in this direction thank you thank you well, I think that um, after your, your, very, your speech where you've given a uh, very well overview of um, European uh, issues on education and entrepreneurship and really a sort of state of the union where we, where we are at the moment after a few years of, uh, of crisis. Um, and you've also given uh, an, a, a couple of examples where the EU can um, can take initiatives and and uh, and ask, uh, well, encourage member states to to take action in a certain form. Um, and uh, we have had some uh, challenging questions uh, on on these uh, these initiatives uh, and expectations from from youth perspective, um, uh, and and uh, and ask for concrete actions. Um, before I, I turn to the, to the floor for some questions bec before the coffee break uh, at 11, I myself am very interested in, in, in this mismatch that you're, you are um, talking about. So maybe we can collect some questions and you can also um, uh, reflect a bit on that in the sense that I was wondering, is it a mismatch because um, students have to focus on different areas or do they miss certain certain qualities in terms of um, entrepreneurship or uh, or other skill sets um, that's that's maybe a question from my side um, but please because um, we have a bit over 10 minutes and I would like to to give the floor some room for for questions Not any yet. Can I, can I come back to, to you last comment? Because I, I don't want to leave it in the air necessarily, uh, although I'm tempted to. Because when you say you would want to have more binding, uh, it is of course uh, 
uh, a very loaded uh, statement you make there. Uh, and and uh, we, we are struggling with this, of course. We, uh, the Commission doesn't have the competences to do this. Okay? And I think we have come, uh, pushed the competences as far as possible with um, making collective agreements on, on the targets. On the, uh, on the youth guarantee, but of course, uh, what's going to happen if a country doesn't? The, the, the incentive for the moment is the money, and, and, and maybe the, the, uh, yeah, the investment case for the populations, because if the populations know that in Spain the budget is not used for the youth guarantee or is not fast enough put in place, maybe, maybe that will create also some movement in the country itself. But we don't really have the competences to have binding, binding uh, targets like we have in the stability pact for the economic. And uh, I am personally not sure that we are ready, uh, even if we had the competences to do this, because uh, different countries are so 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 different, and and also because the interlinkages. What I wanted to show with this complicated slide is how the different policies are interlinked. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the reflection that is going on for the moment in in the European context is maybe we need to come to some kind of minimum standards. Maybe that's the right way. I'm, I, I mean, these discussions also take place internally, so if you are... Uh, but, but binding, binding for example, uh, early school leavers to 10%, and binding what? What, what is then going to be the, the, um, the sanction to the country if they don't keep the children in school? Uh, so, so this is going into a quite complex discussion from competences to how would we do some of it. Uh, and and maybe, uh, maybe some of you have other, other suggestions. But, uh, and then your, your mismatch, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the mismatch is real and it is quite large when you look across uh, the, the European context. Most of you don't see this necessarily because you are quite uh, probably on the highest skilled uh, uh, people in, in the European context. Uh, but I can assure you that we have, uh, also in Spain, but also in some of the other countries, uh, really uh, very low skills, uh, skills and competences, and, and therefore also readiness to participate in society and in employment, because it's very often going together also. Uh, people that don't participate in, in society and play their role and very often from migrant populations uh, uh, are, are really, or, or the Roma populations in some of the countries are really uh, not, uh, not, I mean, really not up to, to, to participating in society and in employment as we require for the moment, uh, or as is required. On the other side, you can also see much more should be done from businesses. Give the young people an opportunity to, prov to, to develop experiences. That's why these traineeships uh, that we try to push uh, and the youth guarantee that we try to push should develop that partnership much more because it's easy if you have an overflow of unemployed people, it's, it's, it's easy to, to have, there's a lot of competition for the same jobs. And then it's easier to take somebody with a little bit of experience rather than somebody with no experience. But uh, young people will never, never have experience if you don't give them the, the opportunity. So, it's, uh, so there is a lot still to be done also by us, I think. In the meantime, maybe somebody has come up with... Yes, I can see a question over there. And uh, please shortly introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Maria Sosaya. I'm from Madrid. I'm, I'm living in Portugal with a research postdoctoral grant. And I want just to make a comment about one thing that has appeared here today. I'm always look on the bright side of life. So you have spoken about the crisis and the, the, the session. So I guess that with the, with the point of this conference is that this crisis is the moment for the innovative people 
is the, the moment for the society to reinvent mm -hmm. itself, for the governments to, to risk in new enterprises, enterprises sorry, and for young entrepreneurs to give new ideas for society, for business, etc. Just this thing. Thank you. I, I hope I was not negative because I also like to look at the bright side and uh, sometimes when you look at all of the figures, you, but, uh, but for me, for me it's very much like what we can do, yes we can and there is a lot of opportunities for the moment, but in the meantime let's not forget that some people are suffering uh, through this situation also, including in, in Portugal actually. So uh, we need to, to, to make sure that there is inclusion. Uh, because some people will innovate uh, well and do well uh, in this situation, but it needs to uh, needs to for social cohesion and and to to in respect of the values that we have in Europe and that we all believe in. I hope uh, it needs to be inclu as inclusive as possible. Thank you, and I th I think that you have indeed very well explained that 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 is where there is an uh, opportunity for the EU to, uh, to play a role indeed. Um, I would like to turn to Daniel who has an uh, has additional there. question. There was somebody um, there. First to the floor then if the microphone can reach her. And then you. Um, so following on from that, from that last point and does that work? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I'm Georgina Richmond and I live in, I live here and uh, I don't know what else to say about myself but I'm, I'm based in Rwanda and I'm English and I've observed um, my concern here is what is actually happening in schools when I mean, you talk about education has been mentioned a lot and I've I'm familiar with what's happening here what's happening in England and, and, and differences but on, very recently, I read about um, a study, I think it was Lithuania, that was doing quite well in the PISA um, mm -hmm. uh, studies on maths. But they're abandoning that because they think the PISA thing is asking the, re the wrong questions about maths. And so things that computers can do, they're no longer teaching their kids. They're, they're, they're bringing into the schools a much more creative approach to maths teaching, even though they were doing relatively well. So there's something, my question is, what is the... What is Europe doing to spread best practices? I mean, we know there's a lot that doesn't work. There are obviously places where things are working. And what, is there a formula to help the best reach the places where it's not getting, like southern Europe, in Andalusia, in Spain in particular? Yeah, but uh, I mean, when you look at the PISA results, they are interesting. Uh, okay, you can have criticism about what is it that is measured and, and the, the, the complexity between the mathematics and the, the, and the literacy and the creativity. And, uh, but still, uh, it, it, it just measures really, it, it seems to be still quite relevant. Um, what the Commission, what Europe is doing, I mean, the, 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 and what the Commission is doing, we're doing quite a lot together with OECD because OECD is also doing a lot in, in Paris on, on bringing the different ministries together in best practices and we work, there's a, there's a very good publication just came out from the OECD about the education standards and the PISA results and how to interpret it. Um, I, I think it all comes to, to very much uh, allowing uh, risk-taking and creativity also in the education sector uh, and, and, and move forward into the future. What I said in my introduction, I really believe that is also true for education. Education should not kill people's creativity. It should just harness people's creativity and risk-taking, but help to develop that right, really uh, so that, because you're right, there are a lot of range of things that can be done by machines and by computers and by the time uh, the young children now will work, uh, that will be the same, uh, that will be even more so. So flexibility, risk-taking, uh, development of creat creative approaches is the right way to do also in, in the education sector, I believe.
And that is not the, the case everywhere. Now, there is increasingly exchange. There is a committee. There is an exchange between the ministries. But uh, I think more could be done by uh, the education sector is not always the most innovative, creative in a lot of countries as far as I can see. Uh, so more can be done in partnership, I believe, also. Uh, between business and education, uh, between um, entrepreneurs, actually, and education. What is it that they need, the skills and the competences they need from the children uh, or the young people, in a way? And for a while, in some countries, it was like a, a Chinese wall between education and businesses, no? was not a good thing to do. <laughs> I think that should move a little bit. Anyway. There was somebody else. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I would like to s look around the room for a last round of questions and then yeah. uh, collect them and then go to Liebe France. So, um, first, this lady over here. Hola. Uh, my name is Christina Pick, Hotel La Fuente de la Guerra here in uh, Rondo. Uh, I wouldn't know where to start. There's so many points. Um, I start with uh, one last year. We opened and closed a restaurant right here on the Plaza España in Ronda. Um, apart from many other ideas, one of them was to get at least eight youngsters off the street into work. And um, I've been trying to approach administrative um, um, Ronda here to, to help well, let's start in a different way. At the moment, I found a better way with uh, an, a website called workaway.info to help uh, uh, young people from all over Europe to come. God, where am I? <laughs> uh, to come and uh, work for five hours to study, to be with us in the hotel on all kinds of uh, uh, jobs. Uh, in their gap year, in the period, they don't know what they want to do. There's a lot of insecurity as well about what one wants to do after mm -hmm. having ha had um, a big crisis. And I find um, lots of sticks on the way uh, for entrepreneurship at the moment. One, to start with, uh, with, the, with the credits from banks with a euro EBO of on being a 0 0.25 and the banks asking 7% for credits which is deadly for any business at the mm. moment. And um, so if you then want to have youngsters and help them learn something, having them work for five hours against uh, bed and breakfast, uh, and that is not allowed, and you have to come via the back door from some website, which I think Europe could connect with them very neatly and um, formalize their idea, which I think is, is brilliant, and um, and make things easier for entrepreneurs. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the room at the moment? Um, here, I have one. Um, so I'm Marta. I'm from Spain, and I'm a member of Future Lab. And in fact, uh, one of the things I found is uh, we have been talking about education and um, policies that have to come from government to uh, improve finance and to improve uh, education in general, universities. But at the same time, you said uh, that it's entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, and we should expect public sec sector to implement these measures. So my question is, is, is there something we can do as citizens or as individuals to, um, yeah, to foster entrepre entrepreneurship? Thank you. And then I had a question sure. in the front row. Thank you. Yeah, Jan Brinkman, I'm professor at the Saar. 
Um, I'm Jan Brinkman, I'm Professor at Asada. My question would be related to specific programs and so that you see. So what do you really see? Because you, know, you see many, many examples of activities in many countries. What do you find as are the most exciting, personally exciting programs that go in this area of really empowering people where you see initiatives or so that are really inspiring examples? Especially in the area of, uh, of social entrepreneurship or? Social or entrepreneurship in general or something. You know, where you see certain countries or so they do something that's really very exciting. Or not countries, can be individuals as well. Not kind of just spread the word about really amazing uh, I think those were all. Um, and I would like to uh, give the f uh, last question to, to Daniel over here. Well. Uh, I got interested in the political inclusion of youth because you've mentioned that the country that has the biggest problem with youth unemployment, Spain, has the funds, has the program, but does not doing the progress that is expected. So I'm, as political scientist, I'm trying to find the reason. And first, time that I'm, first thing that I'm locating is maybe the low political inclusion in decision making and lobbying by youth. So I'm wondering, can we, if we include more youth in the decision making on European and national level, of political youth unions, of think tanks, of young people like Future Labs and, and our friends from, uh, from Spain, maybe we can push these policies to be faster implemented and how that can be done. Because I know also even Erasmus for All was a lot pushed by the U political unions in Brussels, youth unions. So maybe we can do about that also on youth unemployment and your thoughts on that. Thank you. A short remark. A uh, very short remark. Actually, it's related to what Daniel mentioned. Um, I was looking at the data of the MEPs that are represented in the European Parliament and I found out that there are uh, not a lot of them. So it's almost 30 people that are aged from 18 to 39. If we can include, uh, if we can consider it, this as a target group of young people, so I would like to know what kind of measures or how uh, young people can be more included in the European level and how they can be represented more in the European Parliament and all in these uh, uh, young forums or lobbying and um, other formal or non-formal groups in order to raise their voice and to bring their own questions by themselves. Thank you. Liebe Franz, I think uh, it's your time for some cl concluding remarks. Well, you have, you have raised several things that are very interesting and I hope we can continue on them. But I will touch on them a little bit because I don't want general concluding remarks, but I, mm -hmm. I will stay also during the day because I think it's, uh, some of the areas are really worth to, uh, to, to deepen uh, further. But I, I, what I take from a lot of the comments and the questions is already is that uh, an, um, an even more activist future lab could really make a difference. If young people's voices are heard by politicians, by people in, in, in the commission, uh, if, if youth is now really carrying the youth guarantee rather than the bureaucrats, it would be really uh, making a major change because your politicians at country level but also your politicians in the European Parliament and the Commission would be pushed further in, the, in a certain direction. And, and I think that movement from the young people itself is important in the political economy that you talk about. So, uh, and, and, and sometimes we wonder where are where, where are the voices of the people that, that should be complaining or acting or uh, campaigning? So, yes, uh, I think you, and this is, a true, th this is the same thing in Rwanda, from Rwanda to Spain to Europe, I think it's the same thing. You, you ex explanation in Rwanda about your bottlenecks and difficulties, I mean, maybe... Uh, a group of people can come together and solve these bottlenecks uh, with uh, and, and, and uh, I mean that's the transformation that we need in a way we need the transformation in society at all levels uh, to to become more innovative more entrepreneurship and and more uh, less re less red tape and difficulties if you want to offer a job to uh, or a training to it should be possible 
and maybe an, an action that we will need to, to take somewhere is, is with the banks. You refer to the banks, but some of you refer to the banks. Okay, it cannot be that the banks are, are blocking. Uh, so the, the banks have been helped by the taxpayers. It is time also to help the taxpayers uh, by the banks, but this needs to be done in a, in a, in a proper way, of course. So. Um, the voices of young people are important, but the voices and, and can be supported by those that support also. That I, I mean, you have honorary youths. I consider myself that way, uh, still as a young person in support of young people. Uh, otherwise, I would not be here. The last question on, on, on fascinating examples, I think there's a, it's a very, it's an interesting question. Uh, it would open up a whole, but I can think, for me, uh, something that, that I... There are two things that come like this to my mind for the moment, uh, but there's surely a, a range of other examples. Is, um, the one is a, a group of business people that came together to look at what they can do for, to, to, for the wallet of the poor. Uh, what they call the wallet of the poor is poor people very often spend more money and are more inefficient and ineffective with their little uh, money in, and, and business can do something about this, making sure that they're, they're not necessarily targeting the poor, but making sure that there's, uh, they, 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 they use the, fun, the finances they have in a more appropriate way for housing, for healthcare, for for, for groceries, uh, and, and there's a group of business people working on this that I find they invited me to participate in this, and I think this is a fascinating avenue. Much more, I, I'm convinced much more in that direction than in the direction of uh, CSRs, because it's a win-win situation. They have, in Belgium alone, they have calculated that there's a market, the poor market is nine, million, uh, nine billion euro. Uh, per year, so they have calculated there is a market, so they can do something about it. So there is, uh, I find that useful to 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 really be involved in. The other area where I'm I'm quite uh, impressed with also is uh, is a group of people that have come together with a fund, uh, kind of crowdfunding actually to do mentoring of uh, of uh, young entrepreneurs. Uh, they come in with people with experience when they need it, but without smothering. Uh, at a certain stage, a young person needs uh, needs to know the legal uh, uh, the, or the business plan, and then they come in, coach, mentor, and and that is financed by the crowdfunding, uh, crowd financing. So you have a lot of formulas like this that you know. Uh, probably better or even uh, more than me. It's like like angels coming in, and but but there is a lot of opportunities. I think that we and I'm looking for also in in how far we can incentivize some of these initiatives without without putting a tap of on 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 the entrepreneurship in a way and the creativity. So that's I think what I want to say now. But I'm still looking forward to participate in the debates and and the and learning from you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, we are uh, finishing this session. We have indeed uh, three sessions this, this morning and two this afternoon to, to uh, have more discussions. Um, and uh, I understand that, that Mrs. Franzen will, will, will be in the room as well. Um, so um, it's up to me to, to Thank you, uh, Mrs. Franzen, also, of, of course, the future lovers, and uh, for your, your input and, and challenging questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a very interesting panel. Of course, I think we need a transformation at all levels. Let's work on that. And in the meantime, let's go and have a coffee. I please, uh, we, uh, in order to keep the schedule as it's been planned, I think quarter to 12, please, uh, I call you to be in the room so we can start with the next panel. Thank you very much.